All right. Hello, hello, La Scuola family. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It is, we're in April. So hopefully y'all had a great spring break and it was restful. And if it's not restful, hopefully you'll find some rest um, later on this weekend. And so today we are recording the session. So those of you who cannot join us, um, you will have access to this. So hello to you out there. We have a really good friend of mine, Allison Kenny, who's going to be joining us today. And I um, shared Allison's bio um, widely, and you can probably cyber everything about her. She has so many different things, but I would love to do an introduction for you. Um, some of the identities I know that you hold is that you're a certified coach, but I like to believe that it's like uh, the certified humanness, how you coach folks. Um, you are a gifted artist. Um, I, I believe that you are a youth development superhuman. So anyone who gets to work with young folks know that it is a, a craft and a skill because you're constantly evolving yourself because just because you're an adult, you don't always know. And Allison and her wife has um, developed many programs for young people around that. Um, Allison's also an extremely humble parent. And I also believe that you're the most responsible human being. So thank you so much for joining our La Escuela community today. Our topic today is, um, we're calling it Things I Need You to Know About My Neurodivergent Child. And so I'll pass it over to you because you and I decided on what to call this session. So I'll go ahead and let me know if I could support you around screen share or if you want to do it yourself, I'm here to support you. Thank you so much, Fong. And I'm just like living in your love words as your love language like thank you for that introduction and um for welcoming me it's a pleasure to be here with all of you i've been really looking forward to this um and before i jump in i'm actually going to start with our title and bring in some words um, that were anonymously submitted by parents some from this community some from my community some from me and my wife personally um without sharing names, but wanting to bring forward some experiences to just hopefully have a heart opening moment to start off our session. Mm -hmm. um, so here are some of the ideas that came forward when we asked um, folks if they were willing to share and have it shared here. What I need you to know about my neurodivergent child she pushed a kid on the playground because she felt terrified. She's not aggressive. She has PTSD. What I need you to know is she never leaves anyone out. That my child is not badly behaved. That there's a reason for their reaction. What I need you to know about my child is they are the most generous person I know. That it is so isolating sometimes. What I need you to know is that whenever possible, see people and interactions through an MGI lens, most generous interpretation. What I need you to know about my neurodivergent child is that sometimes she screams for hours at home and I don't know why. It could be the lighting or the fabric or the time of day. I don't know how to help her. What I need you to know is I don't want to apologize for my son to people. That my kid has natural and valid abilities and emotions that are behind all their behaviors. What I need you to know is to ask, listen, and believe people when they tell you what they need to feel included in the group. What I need you to know is I don't want him to hear his diagnosis explained to strangers. What I need you to know is my child has a different way to code the world. To please give my family the benefit of the doubt that my child is brilliant and should be celebrated. Thank you for taking that in and for this space to say these things. And I'm just curious, welcome if you're just joining now, I know many of you are in transit, but as I bring those voices forward, I'm curious what feelings come up when you listen and hear, um, and you're welcome to come off mute and just say how that landed with you and how you're feeling or put it in the chat if that's better. But we just had a window in 
How does it feel to hear it? I'll go. Um, it feels... We lost um, you right before the juicy part. Say it one more time. It oh, feels you, you, Sorry, am I in a bad, no probably in a bad spot? No, I just said it feels, it's so emotional. It's so emotional and so sad. And it's such a good reminder that, you know, I think as a parent and as an adult and as a human, right, in the world, like it's so easy to um, to, to judge, right, what's going on. And, and you just, it's a, just such a good reminder. You just like never know what's going on with anybody, with anybody's family. And um, I think it's, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, just, it's just a good reminder of that. It's always, you know, it's quick, quick to jump to, it's easy to be quick to jump to conclusions. And um, it's a good reminder to just always have compassion and uh, empathy and to, you know, remind yourself of that, I think, out in the world. So that's all. Yeah, thanks for naming that, Robin, that um, we are wired to go into judgment and criticism first. We'll talk more about some of the whys in a little bit, but that's, um, that's a very typical reaction, even if you're the one having the unexpected behavior. Any other feelings um, that folks are moved to share? I would say for me, sadness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could imagine the pain and, and the feeling of isolation mm -hmm. that many kids feel in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And parents too. Mm -hmm. Totally. Thank you for naming that. I came on a little bit late, but um, what I got from it was just, you know, barriers of understanding, you know, just not mm -hmm. understanding, having the empathy, basically, to understand what somebody's going through. Yeah, thank you for naming that. And just that word empathy. One of my hopes for tonight is that we can all walk away um, with a little bit of a process to activate our empathy um, when it's stuck for a moment and that we actually can tap into a well of empathy at any time, but it takes some uh, conscious intentional work. Um, and there are many barriers. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Any last things that want to be said? <laughs> Hi, buddy. Allison, I would say in addition to the, the empathy and the compassion and sadness, mm -hmm. I was just holding um, that you were the vessel to share the words and the story so there's like this generosity because mm -hmm. you know we don't parents should not have to explain themselves and that you are sitting here and reading the words and just even like the way you brought yourself into is just this generous expansiveness for for all of us to come into this conversation so mm -hmm. thank you thank you for that thank you fong yeah, I'm, I'm showing up tonight, um, honestly, not as an expert, other than an expert on my own experience and my family's experience, but really as an artist and a human um, wanting to be in community with you and share some about what I know and what I've learned, certainly. Um, but I also want to honor their folks on this call or who will listen later, who also have direct experience with um, neurodivergence in their family and beyond that will um, have also a lot of expertise. And so centering these stories felt important right from the get go. Um, but I can share my screen here for a second and kind of open up that basically tonight I'll share a little more about who I am um, briefly since Fong did such a great intro. And then I'll, I will present a few sort of definitions and then um, a framework that I have in mind about that activating empathy process and make room at the end for questions. Um, but if there is a need or a question that surfaces early, um, feel free to bring your voice in. Um, I feel like we can co create this space today. Um, but I will share here um, that some of the identities I'm bringing with me tonight are that of a coach who primarily works with 
um, adoptive parents. Um, that's one of my identities as well. And many of us adoptive parents have kids who are neurodivergent. And so I spend a lot of time um, with this topic with families. Um, it's my passion and my calling. Um, but I also have done some work with Fong and other amazing practitioners around um, anti-racism and equity work. Um, so I definitely am holding disability justice and neurodivergence at the intersection of all social justice movements, racial justice in particular. Um, I do, like Fong mentioned, I have tons and tons and tons of experience um, running arts-based, after-school programs, in-school pop-ins. Um, it's just, I feel so lucky to have done that for, gosh, almost 20 years now. Um, but in particular, I wanna highlight some of the knowledge I'm bringing forward tonight um, is through training I received in an inclusive um, classroom um, series of workshops with a woman named um, Christy, um, uh, Christine Diagostino, and she has since, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the name of her foundation because it's new to me. I got to work with her when she was on her own, but she's created since the Collaborative for Educational Services. There it is. And so I got specific training from her about making the programs I was running as an organizational leader um, inclusive to um, diverse abilities. And so I'm going to bring what I learned forward here tonight. I'm also holding my privileged identities as a white cisgendered woman, um, a mother by adoption, and that I myself identify as neurodivergent and um, live with a chronic illness that causes some um, cognitive um, impairment and difference. And so I'm showing up with my whole self tonight. Um, I'm grateful to be here with you. And um, want to make room if there's anyone. Again, I know you're traveling, but um, some of you. But if you want to put in the chat any of the identities you're holding and bringing forward tonight, no pressure to. But if it would feel good to name um, some of the pieces of you, I want to welcome that as well. Something I can tell about this community is that people seem to show up with their whole hearts and whole selves, and that's um, such a gift. So let's just start with the question, what is this word neurodivergent? For some of us, it may be brand new. For some of us, we know it really well. And I started with a dictionary definition of this word on purpose. It's a little bit cringy. Um, this definition here says that neurodivergent folks are differing in mental or neurological function from what is considered typical or normal, cringe, 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 frequently used with reference to autism, autistic spectrum disorders um, who are not neurotypical. My understanding is this word did come um, in the 90s from um, the autistic community. And um, one thing I liked that, um, oh, that's on the next slide, but this one I'll just say, um, they added this note here that there are some things neurotypical people just know or can figure out and that neurodivergent students may need to have a model for. So they were speaking specifically to educators here. And I thought that was an interesting framing. Like you might have to have a separate model for the kids on the side who aren't getting it, right? And so this kind of definition and this kind of example is what is ta was taught and sometimes is taught in training programs. And I just named that. Um, to activate our critical minds around noticing that language is evolutionary. And even though this term neurodivergent is comfortable for most folks that I know that identify this way, um, there are ways that it's taught and talked about that may not feel good at all. And so I'm just naming that to say we're always learning, we're always looking at language, we're always reading deeper. And I'm gonna bring in a quote from Dr. Nick Walker here who offers as an autistic um, person who identifies as neuroqueer, so a much more radical um, offering for the same concept, they write, all we need to do is take stock of our words, concepts, thoughts, beliefs, and worries, and see whether they make sense if we throw out the concept of normal, the concept that there's one right way for people's brains and minds to function. So as we're learning, I wanna bring this narrow queer perspective forward of 
if we're presented with a false binary that there is normal and not normal when it comes to how brains work and when it comes to diverse abilities, um, that can be a little red flag for us, a little like, nope, no thank you, I don't buy into that. Similarly, neurotypical, um, this is a dictionary definition, is um, described as not displaying or characterized by autistic or other neurologically atypical patterns of thought or behavior. I do like that they name neurotypical individuals often assume that their experience of the world is either the only one way or the correct one. So what I liked about this is it's just that reminder that, oh, we might all believe because of ableism, which we'll talk about in a second, that there is one right way to think, one right way to do, one right way to focus, one right way to show up, and that anything outside of that is abnormal. And if we can acknowledge that's our default setting, then we can challenge those thoughts, beliefs, worries to Dr. Nick's point. And I want to say that even as someone who's neurotypical and that, or that's neurodivergent, sorry, and that my daughter is as well, I still am living in that paradigm constantly and constantly working to dismantle it. It's really deeply ingrained. So again, we just get to get curious about how this shows up in ourselves and each other and in our communities and instead strive for this idea of neurodiversity, which is that the diversity or variation of cognitive functioning in people is real like every other form of diversity there's not a normal standard that everyone else is an exception to the rule that if we're embracing and honoring and respecting truly neurodiverse environments we're acknowledging everyone has a unique brain and therefore different skills abilities and needs and i do like how this was phrased this to me is a quote you could say to a second grade kid everybody has a unique brain well, we know everybody has different skills, right? We all have our abilities. So it's not that we would need to point out on the playground that kid has different abilities. It's instead this normal, normalizing and creating a culture of respect for neurodiversity, like we would with every other kind of neurodiversity. I'm gonna just share this about ableism and then I'm gonna pause and check in real quick that sort of default setting, those invisible rules of what the right way is to behave, think, um, act, right? Those invisible rules are rooted in ableism, which is a prejudice or discrimination against people with disabilities and can be intentional or unintentional. Ableism is ultimately founded on the belief that people with typical abilities are superior and in turn, those with disabilities are inferior. There are many harmful stereotypes, misconceptions and generalizations about people with disabilities. So I know I switched from neurodiversity to the word disabilities. There is, that's like a 2.0 workshop to go into. Do people that are neurodivergent also identify as disabled? Are they the same thing? Are they different? What do the laws say? That's like really juicy stuff to research. What I can say here is that there's an interconnected web between the two pieces. And why I, why I wanted to bring it here is because the disability justice movement is working so hard to root out ableism as an aspect of white supremacy that it feels important to name here that this idea that certain bodies and brains are superior is rooted in all systems of oppression. And so um, the other thing I'll say here is that each of us is the expert on our own experience. So if someone identifies as neurodivergent, they may also identify as disabled or not. So we don't make assumptions, we allow folks to reveal themselves to us. Um, and, and that's an opportunity for trust building when someone wants to share and explain the why. Um, but let me just pause here and make a little room. Um, if anyone who identifies yourself as neurodivergent or has a child 
who is neurodivergent. If you'd like to speak to any of the things that have been shared so far, I want to make room um, to just center those identities um, around these definitions. It's very possible that I said something you don't agree with or that you, you would name differently. So I would love to hear it if anyone wants to bring your voice in now. Oh, great. I'm learning that the chat is actually not working. So that's great. So then I'll just um, that it's we're not using chat tonight. So no problem. Um, I want to make room if anyone wants to come off mute and just share um, and no pressure to but um, again, I welcome disagreements, different take something else that you've learned recently, anything from your own experience regarding these concepts. I'll say something. Like, hi. Please. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> hi. Um, uh, my kid is in Grandi Verdi, um, but I, I teach um, at a college uh, and I have ADHD, which I recently learned was <laughs> neurodivergent. I was not even aware of it because I think it just wasn't part of like when I was diagnosed. Um, like, I don't, I don't know. I'm so interested to just like hear how the whole field has developed. Um, but uh, I've, I've definitely like worked that into my teaching. And I love what you were saying about how this isn't about like identifying kids who are different. It's about how like the, the ways that you teach and engage with kids can benefit everybody. Um, and I've definitely found that um, I feel like having that experience of like different, a different way of, you know, <laughs> my brain working and thinking about things and focusing on things has really made me like uh -huh. depth in the classroom at spotting ways to engage students who wouldn't other engage, otherwise engage. Um, so I'm uh, really happy in getting the word out. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thanks for sharing that part of your identity and also your experience. You reminded me of the phrase, some kids like. One of the questions teachers were writing in with is, how do we bring this awareness into our classrooms? We just narrate. Well, some kids like having a exercise band around the metal parts of their chair so they can press their feet into it all the time. Some kids like to have earphones on in the classroom because it helps them focus. And there are lots and lots and lots of tools like that that many kids benefit from. It's not like if you have ADHD, you're probably gonna want this thing because not everyone with ADHD is the same right or each the expert on our own experience so we don't generalize but we do create a culture where neurodiversity is honored so thanks yeah. for that i i think too it's interesting that i never told people that i worked with until moving to the bay area which i think is just like a more it's like when you tell somebody in the bay area they're like oh cool <laughs> like yeah um but yeah, me too yeah. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> let's right. talk about it yeah um but i've told people in the context of work because i'm i'm like the, I, I try and see it not as like a deficit, but as certain skills that I have. So it's like when something is new, I can focus on it like forever. <laughs> yes. and it's only like when the newness wears off. So I think that was like a, a stereotype a lot of people have about it is that like you just can't focus, you're hyperactive all the time. And it's like, oh no, actually you can focus more intently than most people on something when it's new and interesting. It's just actually I have laser so, focus yeah. yeah so I've just told I, I, I tell people I'm like it's like a superpower it's like if you have something that you need like someone to take initiative on like give it to me I'll never finish it but like other people can finish it and so it's been really great to like have that as sort of a knowing where I can fit in on like a team um yeah. and I'm curious to know how that's taught like again my experience is completely in the world of higher education so how that works mm -hmm. at, like the elementary and secondary you know and preschool level yeah, it's so important. The process you're naming is exactly it. It's if we're really honoring that there's no one right way and everyone else is on the side getting accommodations. If there's instead neurodiversity, then some kids like this and some kids like this and some kids like this. And also, isn't it wonderful how Sarah can laser focus on the topic that she's the most interested in. Wow, we can really learn a lot from her superpower of laser focus. So when we're working with kids, we're always tracking their assets, right? We're always paying attention to how to lift them up, how to encourage them. And so it's no different. It, it may take um, more presence and awareness to notice the assets because they may feel unexpected to you, but they're there they're there. So we have that lens and we keep looking and we say them out loud and we make sure that 
um, every kid in our classrooms, in our playgroups, in our communities, in our school knows that we know as their adult allies how they shine and that we're always going to be lifting that up. And so then when other kids are interested in relating to one another, they're also aware of those gifts because they've been broadcasted. We've been celebrating and appreciating each other out loud all the time. And there's always a superpower ability to lift up about someone. Um, you mentioned you didn't know ADHD was part of neurodivergence until recently. Um, yeah, right? So this term is, is what's considered an umbrella term. And I put this slide together. It is not an all-inclusive list of what falls under the category of um, neurodivergent um, or neurodivergence, but here are a few things. And you can see they are vastly different. There are probably things here you haven't heard of. I encourage you to Google it. But the main thing is a real honoring of the diversity of experiences. Um, that are possible under this umbrella. And when we think about this and probably 10 more things that aren't written here, I want to encourage us to just be aware that um, many, 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 many people all around us identify as neurodivergent. Even if they're not aware of it and don't say it, they have some of these pieces going on. It's not that abnormal. In fact, we can all relate to um, the the experience of PTSD, which is a condition I have that impairs me cognitively and affects my processing. It's rooted in fear. Any of us who've experienced fear and anxiety can understand how we lose focus and our brains become foggy and we're not able to be um, in a learning, calm, relaxed brain if that fear is activated. So maybe you don't have the diagnosis, but you can have empathy for someone who does. If we're able to really just um, grow our capacity and awareness to understand that um, in the world that we live in, most people have experienced trauma. Many people have um, all kinds of processing to cope with um, this planet that we all share. And so if we can just stretch out of, oh, there's someone who has something, I don't understand it, and just go, yep, we all have something and, and Google the stuff and educate yourself. It becomes a lot less loaded or scary. Um, and this is what I want to share about um, creating a culture of respect for neurodiversity. And I'm realizing I do have a request, Fong. Can you help me with um, time? Yes. How do you want to track it? Yeah, if you can just um, let me know when we have 20 minutes left. Okay, I'll let you know, um, drop it in the chat or do you want me to do a verbal cue? Uh, chat's great actually. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, because I really want to make room for everyone's questions. Um, but this is the framework that um, I go by as a teacher, as a mom, as someone developing self-compassion for my own neurodiversity. I wanna offer this notice, narrate, normalize as a way to activate our empathy and create this culture of neurodiversity and respect for it. So when I, when I share notice, this is that mindfulness piece. This is when we go, oh, I'm in a grocery store and I see a kiddo throw their body on the ground and start kicking and screaming, but they're not a toddler, they're 13. I am afraid and frozen and my six-year-old is with me and I'm noticing maybe judgmental thoughts, right? Here's a scenario. Um, the noticing is becoming aware of what our brains and bodies are doing in response to um, what some might say is unexpected behavior. Um, that's a phrase I got that actually might be outdated now. I should, I should look it up. Um, but my point is, if it's unexpected to you, it may create that reaction. And so we can notice and we can um, be aware 
oh, I'm, I'm triggered, I'm feeling something. What are the feelings? Take some breaths, whatever you do to center yourself and just go, oh, something's happening here. And we can have that critical thinking. Are the feelings and thoughts I'm having, are they rooted in ableism? Are they rooted in another system of oppression? Like, where is this coming from? And I offer that because I have found in my coaching with clients that the best way to interrupt negative thinking and critical voices is to call bullshit on the system where it came from. Pardon my language. Is to say like, oh, there's ableism. I don't actually believe that. And it takes some practice, right, to notice. But if I see that child on the floor and I'm thinking, that child is way too old to behave that way. So that's my belief that children should behave a certain way at certain ages. And that should is that definition of normal that Dr. Nick is talking about. So that's that's ableism. So I can start cultivating an awareness of, oh, that's um, that's an ableist thought. Okay, hello. Let me distance enough and decolonize that thought to go what do I actually believe here? And so this is like that, just that self-awareness and being with yourself to notice, to breathe, to name what's going on, and to ask yourself, what am I choosing to believe? Am I making up a story about this kid on the grocery store floor? What am I choosing to believe? So we might be tempted and will jump into um, wanting to connect with our kid, we might want to immediately go into something with them, but I encourage this notice step first so that we're grounded and rooted in what do we actually believe? And that's up to you and your family. But to be in charge of our thoughts around this, to be in charge of the path we want to go down. And then the second step of the framework I'm offering is narrate. And I want to give Chrissy Diagostino the credit for this tool, but also I've heard it in every therapeutic setting I've ever been in with my daughter and her therapist, that um, the biggest gift we can give to the communities we're building, families, classrooms, school communities, is to narrate with curiosity, compassion, and non-judgment. Because um, I, I like to use the phrase, name it to tame it. You know, when something's happening that may feel unexpected to some folks, um, for lots of folks, it's completely normal to see a 13 year old kicking and screaming in a grocery store like yeah they probably didn't get the chips they wanted and they're mad about it I get it. Right, so it's not actually unexpected to all of us, but anyway, the narrating is a way to bring voice. Um, to name and tame. Other fears judgment stigmas that might be happening in the space around us, and so there's lots of ways this can sound and this is the answer some, some answers to some of the questions I was hearing about how do I talk to my kids about this, what do I say in the classroom, so the narrating can sound like. Um, empathy narration like well, let me think of another example like um okay so a, a six year old in their classroom got frustrated with what they were working on ripped up their paper broke their pencil and kicked the bottom of the chair. So in that case, there may be someone ideally that can give some one on one support to that kiddo and help them get what they need in that moment. And the rest of the kids may be having a feeling, a reaction, a judgment. So the kind of narrating we can do is I notice they're feeling they seem to be feeling so frustrated. Have you ever felt like that? Of course. We've all felt frustrated. I notice that when they get frustrated, um, they, and again, this may not be in front of a whole classroom like this, but I'm giving examples of some sound bites that how we might talk about it in smaller groups, how we might process it later. Um, in front of the whole group, I might say something like, I can see they're really frustrated. I am so glad that they're getting the help they need um, as someone is moving forward. Um, thanks, Fong, as someone is moving forward to support them. And so it can be noticing with empathy and curiosity. I wanted to say that it um, can be narrating what's happening like a scientist, not judgments like, oh, that kid um, 
is having a really hard time. They probably da 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 da. We don't know. We can say, I see that the pencil is broken. I see tears. I see kicking the chair. They need an outlet for their big anger and for their feelings, and someone is helping them. Um, how do we take care of our anger? Does anyone else want to share? It's like narrating and the second part of normalizing um, the action that is happening in a compassionate, non judgmental way. But we don't pretend it's not happening and we don't um, make assumptions or broadcast a story about any particular child. Um, which I get is like, there's a, there's a lot there. I'll give a few more examples and then I'll make some room for um, sharing too. This is a good place to narrate. Um, you know, everybody handles their frustration in different ways. Um, everybody learns uh, this lesson in school in different ways because everybody's brains are different. So some people um, have a teacher help write out the notes. Other kids love writing out the notes themselves. Others are still learning and write parts of the notes. So we're also narrating just different ways people enter into the learning space and what happens and what um, is possible. And we normalize those tools. We narrate, yeah, for some kids, it can feel really good to have a chair that they rock in. It actually helps them learn and focus better. Isn't that cool? Um, what helps you learn and focus better? Um, a phrase that I got, and this might not be one that works for everybody, so I'm really open to hearing um, if if you have a kiddo with neurodivergence, how this feels to you. But something I learned in my training is that um, that lifting up of ability while also normalizing different abilities can sound like, um, my daughter is heaven, it could sound like, you know, I see that heaven is ripping up her paper. She's still learning to have calm hands when she feels frustrated. You know a lot about having calm hands. How do you keep your hands calm? That's so great. She can really learn a lot from you. And you know what I notice about heaven? She never leaves anyone out. She's an expert at including friends. So maybe that's something you can learn from her. It's that like balancing of narrating ability and not villainizing anybody, but also not pretending that, um, you know, behaviors that could cause harm are okay, right? So it's okay to feel frustrated. It's not okay um, to throw your chair that could hurt someone else. So we're going to help them get calm so they can be safe and sound in the classroom with us. Um, those kinds of nuances, but we're we're basically narrating so that we are externalizing what's happening for kids to digest. Is that making sense? Okay, I feel like I could do like a whole hour just on this piece. So there's a lot here. The last is just normalizing. Um, and I've given examples. It's that this process of noticing, narrate and normalize is meant to um, create a culture where Everything's talked about, everything's out in the open, nothing is um, taboo or a problem. It's just like, yeah, this is how life is. Um, another phrase that I use often um, in these settings is, it makes perfect sense that so-and-so would be feeling such and such about that. It just, it makes perfect sense. Um, I would bring that forward. Lots of people have trouble with transitions. Um, finding ways we can connect as adults like, oh, I can really see they did not want to come in from the playground just now. I get it. When I'm on my lunch break, I don't want to go back to work either. Normalizing, normalizing, normalizing. So I'm going to pause there and just make a little room to hear if anybody wants to share which of these steps calls to you the most and why. What's resonating? Awesome. I just want to say, actually, I really just appreciated the narration example. So I guess it's very helpful, helpful for the classroom, especially as an educator, um, just to hear you walk through that. So I, I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate those examples. Oh, good. You're welcome. You're welcome. If there's time, we can even do more. Because um, once you start narrating, you can't stop. It's like <laughs> I'm now narrating around the dinner table. My 50 year old wife's like, got it, like quit narrating, <laughs> but it's a skill and then that's how you live. Um, <laughs> anything else for folks 
anything that is a surprise to you or that feels particularly good to hear about or even not so good to hear about. Cool. Okay, then I'm gonna share with you one of my favorite quotes and then I'm gonna stop screen sharing and make room for questions. Do y'all know Sonia Renee Taylor? Give me a nod if you've heard about her. It is my pleasure to introduce you to her. She's one of my favorite people in the world. She's not a friend of mine. She's an incredible thought leader and she identifies as neurodivergent. She's a um, black identified queer woman who is the author of both the book and the, the movement and website and workshops, My Body Is Not An Apology. And if you haven't read that book, I recommend it as like foundational to um, what she talks about in this quote. Her stance is this, body terrorism, so we could think body and brain terrorism, is a hideous tower whose primary support beam is the belief that there is a hierarchy of bodies, I would add, and brains. We uphold the system by internalizing this hierarchy and using it to situate our own value and worth in the world. And I just love that terrible image she gives us of this hierarchy. And so if we are creating a neurodivergent culture, we're dismantling this hierarchy of brains and bodies. And that is my hope and my wish for every classroom and every home and every like school community. And I just love her. So with that, I'm gonna pause talking for a second and just um, make a little room for questions that are emerging now. And then I also have some on the page I can speak to, but let's start with who's in the room. Um, what question or scenario is coming to mind um, that would feel good to get some input on? I think I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, former students that absolutely amazing um and one in particular was um had dyslexia mm -hmm. and you know and I'm thinking about as much as you try to uplift and you know be there for the child and, and constantly you know let them know about all of their abilities all of what they do that's so well mm -hmm. that especially you know I teach in the middle school so getting into that that the comparison you know and it's so brutal at that age you know and just you know, like Sherry Glukoff Wong says, you know, everyone wants to know that they're unique, but totally the same as everybody else, you know, like they, they yes. need both of those. And, and, you know, that's really the truth, you know, especially at that age where you're 12, 13. Um, and I just, you know, I, I hear you, the narration, and that's, it's so important. Um, but just, you know, I've seen the students just go down this self-esteem um, just knowing, feeling different, you know, constantly different. And I don't know if you have any more advice about, you know, how to go about, you know, helping, you know, their self-esteem and, and when, it, when it feels like it's not working, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So that's a tough question, at Sophie, but. Oh, it's, it's, thank you for bringing it forward because what comes to mind is two things. Um, well, a few things. There's a kind of narration that I was modeling that is in particularly in particular effective with preschool and elementary school kids. Those are the spaces where that kind of narrating um, can be really, really, really important. And in the case of many kids, including my daughter and the middle school she goes to, um, kids that are there are 13 and 14 and developmentally closer to seven, eight, nine. And so sometimes, even with those older ages, there are times, because every day is different, our ability with neurodivergence, our ability is different on any given day. And that's real. We can perform academically one way on a Monday and show up on a Tuesday and not have that same ability or capacity at all. We also, um, in the case of many kiddos, can show up sort of emotionally at different ages at different times, which I'm sure you've seen in your classrooms. And so um, that's a that's a complexity I want to honor that you may have a 13 year old who's feeling six. And while not in front of the group, 
the one-on-one -on -one narration could actually be really effective. Like when my daughter is triggered, she needs three word phrases. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's different. You're okay, you got this. I know you feel bad, but I feel good about you right now. Mm -hmm. It's the like simple, 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 simple. Mm -hmm. And it's knowing that it's like raindrops because the shame of not feeling able can be an extreme trigger. Mm -hmm. And so helping combat the shame in the moment with kindness and I can see that you feel bad about who you are, but I only feel good about who you are. I'm going to hold that good feeling until you are ready to feel it again. Mm -hmm. And then what, what I can see with my own kid and, and kids I've taught is that it might seem like the, the ways that we're offering empowering language or empathy aren't getting us anywhere. And in fact, sometimes it can activate, no, I'm not, you know, I am stupid. I hear you, I get it. Um, they still may be able to access those same encouraging words you gave on a different day. So it's not for nothing. And, and it's an opportunity for different learning styles there too. If, if hearing it could be triggering or, you know, make the fire blaze bigger with them, it could be a, a loving note. Um, you know, read this after school. I'm gonna leave this on your desk for you later when it feels good. Yeah. Um, but to just not give up and know that they're dismantling ableism in themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's really freaking hard. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, it does. It's, yeah, definitely. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Allison, I was wondering if you could, um, I love this framework. The, the notice, narrate, and normalize. Mm -hmm. And I think as a parent, um, the notice part, so notice what's happening inside of yourself. And I'll say this and I'll say it from the identities I come from. It's mm -hmm. especially hard as a, a parent with the identities of like uh, having your immigrant parent upbringing, yeah. Asian upbringing, you know, the, the mm -hmm. um, being able to notice what's happening inside of you before you can get to the place to narrate, right? Like mm -hmm. quickly not going to judgment of like that kid's misbehaving or they should not do that because that was what I grew up in, right? It's, it's sure. that binary of good, bad, no, yes, you know? And so mm -hmm. it's like such a process to slow down. And it, like I said, it's a process. So, um, mm -hmm. I do it and sometimes are better than others. I'm just curious, you know, as parents in the community, what have you noticed is supportive? Like what kind of conversations can we have? Cause I know we send our kids to school, this amazing school with teachers like mm -hmm. Melina and everyone. So, but I do know as, as, as parents, we have to do our part too, because they're not in school all the time. They're with us half the other time. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that area around notice is like a conversation, like, peace you know because that's how we can unpack it so just curious mm -hmm. if you have any coaching tips or, mm -hmm. you know, or if you even make sense what I'm saying oh yeah it makes a lot of sense and I appreciate you bringing in um the the root of the cultural beliefs that you grew up with and I know that there are many families and across different cultures that um would have a similar um feeling about behaviors being right or wrong. Um, and so it's important to honor that, that, that um, we're showing up with everything we've been given um, for all the reasons. And we're hardwired to believe things based on um, where we're from and how we grew up and the systems that we are all in. So I say that to just be like, we get to have tons of compassion for ourselves when if our first reaction is even if we say out loud something judgmental in front of our kids, for example, about another kid, we get to, if we're willing, if it feels right, if it feels like where you want to be headed in how you embrace this, um, we can model this process um, transparently with our kids. We can say, well, I noticed that I got really tense when I saw such and such happening. I noticed that I thought Oh, why is that kid behaving that way? And then I remembered kids have really good reasons for behaving the way they do. I wonder what they were feeling. I wonder what they were needing. Um, 
and entering in the conversation with whoever you're with. Um, but being transparent to catch it and interrupt it is one coaching tip I would offer. Um, and holding ourselves with compassion as learners yeah. um, because that's happening, whether people are saying it out loud or not, that's happening with all of us. Even to the point of, I've said to my kid, um, you know, like in my house growing up, there was one way I had to act. And if I acted differently, I got in trouble. So um, in our family now, what I really want to do is if you're acting in a way that I don't understand or feel mad about it first, I'm going to really try to pause and say, um, what are you needing? What's going on? Can you tell me about it? Um, instead of just getting mad because that really didn't work for me growing up. That would be my example. Um, and so it's just like narrating upon narrating upon narrating and yeah. activating that empathy, even if we don't feel it authentically till the next day or a week later. Remember that one time we saw such and such happen? I'm still thinking about that. Mm. It's never too late. Right. Thank you. Does that help? Does that super, answer? Okay. Yeah. Super, super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Let me bring in a question that was sent in ahead. Um, someone wrote, how do we or should we have to explain our child is neurodivergent when they have a meltdown in a park or a birthday party in a manner that is clearly different to their cohort? I love this question. I relate to this question as a mom of a kiddo who does things that surprise and um, freak people out sometimes. We don't have to explain anything about our kids ever. That's my belief. We are off the hook. We don't owe anyone any explanation. Um, and we can hold all of our energy, presence, and compassion in being there for ourselves first to stay regulated and calm and grounded, and then for our child second. And we can, if we can, we can have tunnel vision and let the world melt away. And those folks are on their journey. So hopefully they're in spaces like this, they're Googling, they're reading, they're training. We can't control their judgment. And I know that's easy to say, but when we feel the judgment in a community that we want to be inclusive of us, that that can be really hard. Um, but I would just say we're working hard enough as parents to do right by our neurotypical neurodivergent kids and that um, and that we can save our energy for our own work and then know as um, a neurotypical ally that this is how it can feel for parents. And so that's an opportunity to hold that labor to hold that narrating, to hold that explaining, to show some compassion. I see how hard you're working, mama. Can I do anything for you? Can I get you some water? That's when we just like, hey, I see you. you're not alone. You're doing great. You're doing great. Um, so so can, um, mm -hmm. can I just um, follow up on this? So it's interesting because one of the things that I have noticed is that when you give more context, you tend to activate more empathy mm -hmm. in others. Mm -hmm. um, and I've definitely seen it. I mean, I am um, a mother of a neurodiverse child. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have noticed that it changed a lot of attitudes and judgment as I, as, as people became aware of what's going on, because it's sometimes it's, as you said, right, it's much easier to jump into um, the judgmental space and specifically when things aren't clear that like some some people can make assumptions and other people don't make assumptions and I just for me I actually found it helpful when I kind of gave more context and explained things to people in terms of then his experience with others and that how that translated so I'm how do I kind of think through that with what you were just saying I guess mm -hmm. is really the question I want to really honor the experience you're bringing forward. I've had it too personally. Um, what it makes me think of is that when I'm surrounded by strangers, I feel like I don't owe anybody anything. 
and what your naming is when we're in community, at least what I'm hearing, so you tell me if I'm getting this right, is that when we're in community with people that we trust or are willing to be more vulnerable with as we're building trust, we may be willing to share part of our stories. And when we do, often it can activate that empathy and that... Um, totally. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. referring to. It's actually our community, like our school community. Yeah. So just the fact that there's a night like this, just the fact that people are eager and are going to watch this later and want to learn more is a great indicator that, that there's a way we can um, also be willing to tell the truth in a way that will help people picture it. Um, and if people can picture it and they can understand better, um, I remember sharing with um parents in my daughter's first grade community when I felt safe enough to that she had been born not not by me but our adopted child had been born at 1.8 pounds and that it was a miracle she was alive and that when she has that fighting energy at school um it's this fight she's always had to survive and so it can be hard to cope with um but when I shared that I saw their faces change I saw the story in their minds change about her as the one who kicks and throws things at school. So thank you again for saying that. And I'm seeing, uh, I will put together some resources. Someone else asked for a book list and wrote in ahead about that. So I'll be following up as this recording is posted. We'll be sure to post some resources under and I will look for one specific to narration because that's a great point. It is an acquired skill. Um, so I'll look for something that breaks it down in a way that could be practicable. Um, and I also want to give permission to all of us that, um, like any skill will mess up in the beginning and we'll practice and we'll notice, oh, that actually didn't, that didn't feel great. <laughs> what did I learn and how that, and how that felt? Um, let me try again, that there's permission to experiment a little bit as we're learning, um, and hopefully I can find something great that I'll model it in more detail for you. Yeah. Allison, you're the best. And I'm like, I, I was wishing my, my new mom self when I was standing in Trader Joe's, where were you whispering? I needed you whispering in my ear and like all the times my kid threw a tantrum. Um, you're such a gift, um, I mean, for, for me in our partnership and friendship. And thank you so much for mm -hmm. staying a little later and supporting us in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, for those folks who are new to our community, um, Melina's here, she's the director of DI. We have Lama who is mm -hmm. our co-chair on our board. We are really working to, um, to deepen our DAI work and what we're looking to do this next year is really including that B. So DEI B, that B is that sense of belonging. And I think all the values, all the frameworks and the strategies that you have offered us here is the very thing that we want to do and we wanna do even more of in our community to support all families to feel seen and heard and supported. And so I want to say that this is probably not the last time that we're going to bring you here and that we're excited to follow up with you to see um, different opportunities. And just thank you so, so, so much. Mm -hmm. And I'll share all your information if that's okay, your blog, your mm -hmm. social media things. And so if folks want to um, connect with Allison and Allison is a very gifted writer too. So if you follow her blogs, you're going to read some <laughs> really funny things, some a lot of heartfelt things and things that you're like, yeah, I, I wish I could have said that too. <laughs> so I would love to invite folks to come off of mute to say thank you so we can hear our voices.